Hello, V. Anton Sprawl here talking about how software works. In this video, I'm going to be talking about random numbers. You know what a random number is. It's like when you roll a die to get a number from 1 to 6. What you may not realize is how often software depends upon random numbers. Computer graphics, for instance, make use of randomness. As I talk about in my book, Making realistic graphics requires tracking how beams of light scatter when they strike the surface of an object. But we can't possibly trace light scattering in every direction, so we have to pick a few random directions instead. Random numbers come up in video games all the time. When you fire a shell in World of Tanks, for example, the damage you do from a successful hit is a random number in a specified range. In games where we face off against monsters controlled by the software, it's usually a lot more fun when the monster actions vary unpredictably, which again requires random numbers. Random numbers are also essential for computer security. Every time you establish a secure web connection, your computer and the computer you're talking with exchange a pair of random numbers used to create a temporary encryption key a process which is explained in the third chapter of how software works. So all kinds of software uses random numbers. But how does software create a random number? This is a lot trickier than it may sound. You see, all the computer processor can do is precisely follow the directions it has been given. In essence, all software does is perform math with numbers stored in its memory and then make decisions about which instructions to perform or not perform by comparing two numbers to see which is bigger. That's really all a computer does. So how does strictly following a set of instructions produce a random result? The answer is it can't. There's actually no way for software to produce a truly random number. So instead, software makes use of what is known as pseudo-random numbers. This is a series of numbers in a particular range that seems unpredictable, but is actually produced by a straightforward mathematical process. Here's an example of a software-based random number generator. This particular generator is going to produce pseudo-random numbers in the range of 1 to 10. We start with some number in this range, let's say 5. We call this number the seed. When we need a random number, we take the seed and multiply it by 8. Then we take the result, divide it by 11, and take the remainder. In this case, that produces the number 7. That's our random number. The 7 also replaces the 5 as the seed. So the next time we need a random number, we start with the 7, multiply it by 8, divide that result by 11, and take that remainder, which is a 1. We keep doing this every time we need a new random number. Now the special numbers we used in the math, the 8 and the 11, have been chosen so they have certain mathematical characteristics and relationships with each other. We can choose different numbers if we want a different range of pseudo-random output. Again, these are not truly random numbers, but the series jumps around enough that it looks like it's random, which is often all we need. This method does have a couple of problems, though. The first is how we set the initial seed, which we chose as 5. If we always use the same initial seed, we'll always get the same sequence of numbers. So, if we're using random numbers to determine the events players encounter in a game, if we start with the same seed, the events are the same every time, which is not really what we want to get out of our randomness. It's better if we start with a different initial seed each time. But how do we do that? Well, one way is to use the system clock. When it's time to generate that first pseudo-random number, we can take some part of the current time, like the number of milliseconds into the current day, and take the remainder of that by 11 and use that as the seed. Another problem is that the sequence produced by these sorts of methods is predictable to someone who knows the details of the particular random number generator. That doesn't cause any problem in games, but if we're relying on random numbers to generate temporary encryption keys for secure web connections, we don't want the possibility of someone guessing what those numbers are. 
Because of this, some processors have special circuits to generate truly random numbers for use by the software. Here's one way that's done. Imagine a room with a sofa and two lamps, one at each end of the sofa. You decide that you only ever want one of these lamps on, so you install special radio-controlled switches on the lamps, such that when you turn the lamp on the left on, it sends out a radio signal that automatically turns the lamp on the right off. And likewise, if you turn the lamp on the left off, it signals the lamp on the right to turn on. And the other lamp does the same thing. You turn it off, the other lamp goes on, and vice versa. Okay, so now imagine both lamps are off, and you stand behind the sofa, stretch out with your arms, and turn both lamps on at exactly the same time. So what happens? A signal is going to go from the left lamp to tell the right lamp to turn off. And a signal from the right lamp is going to tell the left lamp to turn off. Those signals would arrive at nearly the same time, which would turn both lamps off, which would cause both of them to signal the other lamp to turn back on again. So initially, both lamps are going to be frantically blinking on and off, as the signals chase back and forth. But due to random unpredictable variances, something like the chaos theory that Jeff Goldblum character talks about in Jurassic Park, the timing of the signals would wobble and eventually one signal would get far enough ahead of the other that the pattern would stabilize with one lamp on and one lamp off. This is an electrical version of flipping a coin. We turn on both lamps and see whether the left lamp or the right lamp stays lit in the end. If we wanted a random number in a particular range, we could run multiple trials. If, for example, we wanted a random number between 1 and 8, we could run three trials and consult the chart shown. The random number circuit in some processors works like these two lamps, and the output it produces is truly random unless our understanding of particle physics has some fundamental errors. For gaming or graphics, or most of the places where we currently use pseudo-random numbers, these truly random numbers are overkill, but they add an extra layer of assurance for computer security. Well, that's it for this episode. If you find software interesting and want to know more about how it works, please like and or subscribe. Also, check out my book if you'd like to learn more about computer security and graphics and other topics not covered in these videos. Also, feel free to suggest topics for future videos. Thanks.